I don't want to just throw it away. You know? Sure. So, yeah. yeah. If somebody's getting some, some use out of it, or uh, maybe put it to the list if you think it's something. Can you see that? Okay. Is this readable? I mean, yeah. yeah. Okay. So this was uh, the presentation I made with PenguinCon, and this is actually out of date. So don't do that. <laughs> um, but it's a lot easier now. This is what you used to have to do to get Juju installed. And uh, at some point in 12 before, they just said, oh, just install Juju. And then they kind of backed up on that now and said, okay, yeah, use a PTA for Juju because we continue to add stuff to it. And the version that's shipping in, in 12 of those is probably get missing a few features you might want and probably has a few bugs you don't want. Because um, it's pretty new. So this was the Juju Charm School I was going to run. The Charm School is basically, let's create some charms, and this is my description. So, so what is Juju and what's a charm? Yeah, I'll get into that. Oh, okay. And then I skip a couple of the slides there. So what the heck is Juju? Uh, so Juju, um, we call it a cloud orchestration uh, framework, tool. Uh, I think that last meeting, Rick said it better when he said it's app git install service. Uh, it's basically app git for services, which when you think about that at first, you're like, well, I can already do an app git install WordPress, and I can, you know, there's already services in app git, so how's Juju any different? And I think that it's it's a bit about where cloud comes in. So this is a cloud orchestration framework, and I'm going to do some disclaimer about what cloud is, uh, because cloud is probably the most overhyped word in this last 10 years. Sure. Um, everything is cloud if you talk to vendors, but in my mind, <coughs> cloud means it is automatic provisioning, <coughs> automatic scaling, automation to your services. So it's not so much running it out of someone else's data center. I, I think I could be my own cloud in my own data center. It's more automation around your processes, which doesn't mean just if it's WordPress, the web server. I mean also the firewall rules, load balancers, just automation across the entire thing. So um, that's what I think a cloud is. People could probably argue and debate what cloud is endlessly, um, but in my mind, that's what it is. Orchestration, I think, concert, things working together, controlling multiple processes with you know, one tool. Uh, so that's what Juju is trying to be. It's trying to be a tool to manage your cloud presence or your service presence and automatically manipulate it. And it is a framework in that it, when I think framework, I think abstraction. And, and that is abstracting other clouds. So I'll get into that a little bit in a second. Yep, uh, I talked about that, abstraction for cloud. Um, so this is the environment's YAML file. And this is where I'm going to talk about the abstraction. So there's lots of cloud providers. And you can run your own. Um, Amazon, uh, AWS, <coughs> OpenStack. You know, Rackspace is doing stuff with OpenSta OpenStack. HP Cloud, Google Cloud, uh, I don't remember what VMware's is called. Liquid Web has like solar, solar something, or no, storm, storm on demand or something like that. Um, I'm sure everybody is working on their own little private clouds and they all do things slightly differently. Um, and they all, if they're a good cloud, at least I think if they're, if they're a cloud, they probably need to have an API. <laughs> if they're a good cloud, I would say they have an API. And they're all different. So you might you might start to build your service for Amazon, and then you want to deploy it to HP Cloud or something, and you've got to learn new API commands to manage the cloud that Am that HP is giving you versus Amazon. So abstracting that allows you to do one command, write your service once, and then deploy it to multiple different types of clouds. So that's what this file is. The environments file is telling Juju the different types of clouds you can apply, deploy to. So this, because this was a charm school where we're supposed to write charms, um, I'm doing a local deployment. So, so the type is local. It's <coughs> using LXC, which is kind of like ch root on steroids. It's kind of containerized, jailed, um, you know, pseudo virtualized because it's sharing the same kernel and stuff. Um, so this would this might be a typical deployment for a load balanced instance of WordPress. You'd run Juju Bootstrap, which gives you a managing node to, to monitor your cloud and manipulate it. Then deploy WordPress, deploy MySQL, deploy HA proxy to load balance them, add a relation between the database and the web layer, add the relation between the load balancer and the WordPress, and then expose it in your firewall. And that's the commands to deploy WordPress. The old commands. It, it, the WordPress charm has changed significantly. I'll show you the new one. Is right. that because people doing Juju have built so, all that for, uh, 
or people doing MySQL and in uh, those have yeah so, Juju so that's what a charm is so Juju is the service to control everything a charm <coughs> is basically the recipe for how to install WordPress and then someone has written a charm for WordPress a charm for MySQL a charm for HA proxy and each one of those contains scripts that basically say I'm installing it I'm going to stand it up and then when you add a relation there's scripts that say oh now I see a relation what do I do then so I'm going to I'm going to get into that but a charm is the it's a recipe it's the packaging around the service so um, we can kind of go I'll go through these slides real quick but then I'll go into the actual demo so this is kind of like to get you started you can you can start you know creating a charm and then your uh, launchpad ID and stuff. And demo time, perfect. <laughs> so let me get out of full screen mode here. So like I said, it's changed a bit. So this is probably so small. So is Charm like the, the interface then between Juju and whatever the application is? I mean, it, it hides all that? Charm is, Charm is a script. It's, yeah. it's, that's a simple definition. It's a script with some metadata about what you're doing and about what, what parameters you need to pass it. And Juju is just the process that parses the script and then executes across your virtual machines. So who's better at writing the script? The, the Juju team or the MySQL team? Or the well, the MySQL team hasn't written the script. That's the thing. They've written a package on installing MySQL on your machine. And then you've got to go in and manage your IDs and create your database and go through those steps. The charm is some automation glue around those processes when you start adding services. Okay. So you're using the MySQL package, you're using the same binaries, it's, it's basically you're using apt-get in the case of Ubuntu. Um, so this is the new, is this, is this readable by everybody or is it too small? Yeah, that's good. Okay, so this is the new simplified way to install it on 1204. You still have the PPA, you update, and you install Juju. So, so that's not going to be available in your presentation Juju? material? No. Okay. Juju is available in Ubuntu natively, but you're going to want the, the one from the PPA because it's significantly updated. So this is under uh, Juju is Ubuntu under Docs Ubuntu getting Ubuntu started on HTML. Now okay. is this, uh, who, who made Juju? Is this an Ubuntu? This is an Ubuntu canonical effort. Okay. Um, the thing about it is that it is, it's one of the one of the complaints about it so far is it is very Ubuntu specific. They've, they've ported it to Red Hat, you can run it in Fedora. Um, and I think it's using, you know, yum, yum in that case. Um, it depends on your scripts that you're writing out. But it is pretty much, you know, this is being pushed for Ubuntu, really supported in Ubuntu. Red Hat guys have a different have a different thing they're approaching. So that's been a complaint against the Juju um, environment. But so after you after you install your PPA and get Juju running, you would run Juju Bootstrap, which would give you a sample environments file. And then you would go into the environments file and start plugging in the data that you would need to manage your instance. So in the case of EC2, there's some bits here, and I'll show you one of the files. So I'm on my EC2 uh, environment over here. And I'm going to show you a sanitized version of my environments file so you don't see my access key and secret key and stuff, but I want to have to change that in <laughs> Amazon later. So I'm basically saying it's a type of environment, it's EC2. I named the environment Juju EC2 because you can have multiple environments in the file. I can have local, OpenStack, EC2. I can just kind of keep making new directives. Um, the access key, you can get this if you have an EC2. I don't know how many people here have used Amazon's uh, cloud services, but when you create an account, you can create an access ID, which is like an API token to write your scripts against instead of using your username and password or something like that. Um, so you've got an access key, a secret key. Um, you have to, there's an S3 bucket, that's what this is. S3 is kind of like a database back storage. Um, so it writes some metadata into there to, man to track on what's been in provisioned in Juju. And OpenStack also has a bucket equivalent. Um, local uses a temp file, I believe. And this is a, an auto admin secret, which is uh, tied to the credentialing that Juju uses to talk between its nodes. And this is dynamically generated, so you don't really need to deal with that. Who your, what your Juju uh, environment is for, what release of Ubuntu in this case, so 1204 is what we're targeting. Our Juju came from a PPA. Um, I don't really know what that directly does. I don't really play with it too much. And this verifies that your SSH um, certificates match the host names, so it does validation that your certificate is issued to the right host name. 
so they have extra security. So you, get, you run Juju Bootstrap, you generate that file, and then you actually run Juju Bootstrap, which I'll do right now. And I'll go over here. This is also on my Amazon instance. And I'll run Juju Debug Log. It's probably not going to work right now because Juju is still bootstrapping. So Bootstrap is actually creating a virtual machine. It's using Amazon's API right now. It's connecting into my account. It's creating a staging machine with all of my management of the environment. So some of these commands debug log, the Juju instances are sending kind of their log into one central place so I can kind of watch what my machines are doing over here when that's finally coming up. And over here you, you've got other commands to interface with it when it, com when it finishes coming online. So let's look at my Amazon services here. So before I had, this is the, my demo machine. That's all it is, is a demo machine, just an SSH host that I was connecting to. And then this was a different thing I was playing with. If I refresh, you'll see a third one come up. It's a size M1 small, which means it's bigger than the free tier. The free tier is T1 micro. But uh, I, you, can, you can control what size of instances things we created. I'll show that. And it says it's running and initializing, so it's not fully created. Now, let's look at some other cool stuff in here while it's doing that. So, if we go to security groups, I did, a, I did a bit of playing, so this is kind of messy, but it automatically created a security group um, for my virtual machines. Right here, Juju, Juju, EC2. It, it, bases, it automatically calls it Juju, which I didn't realize, yeah. and I named my environment Juju-EC2. Yeah. So it made a security group, Juju-Juju-EC2. Uh, and then it makes security groups for each, each virtual machine that I've created, and some of these have been reused. So, automatically creates rules in here. Sorry, this is kind of scrolling off the screen here. To allow my bootstrap node to connect in, and then the SSH to that, and you can, and it, this is machine specific. So all these firewall rules are being dynamically generated as I run the commands. Um, that's all I'm trying to illustrate with this. You don't really need to be in the GUI managing your firewall rules. You run the GUI commands, things happen. Okay, so this set, it sees SSH because the boot node finished booting. So let's tell it to go ahead and continue connecting, and that's it. I think it's connected now. If I run commands, you should see logs start to come over here. So if I run a Juju status, let's see what it says. Authenticity of books can't be established. Yeah, that's because of the SSH key. Mm -hmm. It wasn't in its uh, so authorized machine. keys list in the machine. When you talk about the firewall, is that a software firewall, or are you talking about an actual firewall box? I don't know what that is. That's Amazon's firewall. Okay. <laughs> okay. He also doesn't need to know. It yeah. Is. Well, no, but I mean, I was just saying, how would it open in the, firewall? In the case of yeah. OpenStack or something, it could, be IB, it could be IP tables. Um, it might even be IP tables in Amazon's world. They're actually um, working on stuff like virtual networking and stuff to get into OpenStack firewalls and stuff as well. So basically, it's the, per the layer that you're provisioning to has smarts about firewalling any instances you bring up. Mm -hmm. So on EC2, for instance, you create security groups and then apply it to swaths of servers. You say, yeah. these 20 web front end servers only need to have open ports for port 80, and your security is at a layer above the instance itself. It's kind of, you're able to more easily manage it across hundreds and hundreds of machines yeah. by doing it that way. Yes. It's just packet filtering. No. Okay. So this, this finished connecting, it's seeing the distributed logs from the Juju instances, it sees that there's a machine, agent zero, machine ID zero started. So that's Over the there it says that started. Not yet started, because it probably ran that before that finished. So let me go back, because Juju status is a one-time command. You run it and it spits out your result. And now it says running. If you did like a watch, you know, <coughs> 10 seconds, Juju, you would see it like, you know, update. But, um, so the bootstrap node is running, and now that means I'm ready to deploy some services. So let's uh, let's look at some what a service looks like. So, so you've got a you've got a, uh, a, a cloud virtual machine running out there. You can SSH to it, and that's about it, right? Yeah, you can SSH to it, and all it's doing is coordinating. It's running a service called Zookeeper, actually. Okay, it's coordinating 
your different virtual machines and, and okay. and you're pinging them. Are you up? Are you up? And, and now you're going to deploy a service to it. Yeah. So make it actually do something useful. Yeah, I'll show I'll show you a service. So I've been working on a service for Moodle that is not done because I haven't had the time to finish it. So when this is a my Moodle charm, charm precise Moodle over there. And I started out, you know, you start out with a README and I wrote some stuff in here about, you know, how I think that it should work eventually. And this is probably going to change significantly because I have looked at the work that's been done, the excellent new WordPress charm, there's a lot of great ideas about things in there. So I'm probably going to redo a lot of my assumptions on how Moodle is going to look. But, uh, so anyways, it starts out with a metadata file. This is, uh, there's a charm store. So if you, I think it's charms. Let's go find it. I think it's charms.ubuntu.com or something. <laughs> no, jujubuntu.com slash charms. <laughs> Apparently not. Charm store. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> Launchpad.net slash charms. Sorry. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> There's been some changes to. Nope, that's not it either. Wait a minute, wait a minute. As if I didn't expect that. Yeah. It, it, so they're, they're working there on it. There it is. Yeah. Jujucharms.com. I knew I had the WordPress page up, so I should have just done that. Jujucharms.com. This is actually the WordPress um, charm right there, but I'm just going to go to the main page and say browse charms. So, so here's some of the charms people have built, and they're asking for many more. <laughs> and there's actually some in here that aren't listed that are not quite stable yet. Like the Moodle one has a launch pad, but it's not quite done. So is there anything that tells you like what, like how stable or how good? If it's in here, it's supposed to be stable, especially for the distributions. So yeah. they're precise. I think there are some in here that actually aren't for precise. They go not. through a review process. They have to be reviewed in order to get into the yeah. charm store. So someone from Canonical, from the, the Juju team, will actually review charms as they're submitted and all that. So yeah. Doesn't mean that they have to be spit, you know, spick and span polished, but they got to be pretty, it won't, it will not blow up your system kind of, you know. <laughs> yeah. So if I, if I look at like uh, Minecraft, Minecraft server, right? So all this stuff in here that it's talking about the description of what it is and everything, I'm defining in this metadata file. So I'm calling it Moodle, summary of what it is, a description. Sorry about the space in here, it's the split window thing. And then you're also telling it what it provides. So I'm saying it provides a website with an interface on HTTP. It requires a database with an interface of MySQL. I'm trying to figure out how to do MySQL or PostgreSQL because Google actually does pretty good database abstraction and I want users to be able to pick it and install time. Can you set up multiple interfaces like uh, HTTP and HTTPS? Yes, you can. You would just add another line under website interface. Okay. And you would add HTTPS. Now these are actually um, defined listeners, so as long as Chuck Juju has something for that, it will know about it. If nothing else has provided that before, you've got to do some other work, and I haven't tried to do a charm that offers a new provider, because this is something that people can consume. So if you add a load balancer, it looks for, requires HTTP, right? So does so it look for another charm that does the provision? Or? It, yeah, the charms all link to each other through, the, through this, basically. You're providing and requiring, and you're defining something in here. So when I say I provide HTTP, it's not so that WordPress can run, it's so that other services that can use HTTP can work with WordPress. So you're like creating a hook, basically. Oh, can you have it on a specific port, too? Or oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I want to back up one section. You said all those charms that were listed with the precise attribute. Oh. What, what if you want to do something and you want to know is that a good, who else is working on this? Um, pick a program. Uh, okay. They want you want to write a charm for it. Find out, if find out whether anybody's already working on it. You would look at Launchpad and you would search for a charm for it because there's a lot of charms that are marked. They're, they're created as a bug. So you go to a launchpad ID and under Ubuntu there's bugs and there's charms. Every new charm that's a to-do is, is a bug for the charm. And it's usually marked like wish list, I think. So there's a, there's a lot of stub ones, like people have started up 
Hey, I think there were like four for Drupal, and finally one got picked as the, the Drupal one because everyone said, I want one, and they started making them, and they got to various levels of finished before yeah. someone else yeah, released it. But there's five people working on it already. Let's see what the heck they did. Why should I start at the beginning? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and because it's open source, right? You can always you can always submit patches to an existing charm. So if there's something that's not doing that you can should. Um, so, anyways, this is so this is basically I'm I'm saying I can provide this so that other charms can consume what I provide, and I'm saying I require this. And then when I go to insta install the charm, I won't be able to expose it or add it until I added the other dependency. So it's it's like it's like you're making a package basically. You're listing dependencies and, and everything. That's the metadata. Now in config, you can put a bunch of directives in here that the charm can consume. So add options admin user um, options admin pass. I actually have this removed in the shipping charm because you don't want to provide a hard coded password. Uh, there's a nicer way to do that that I've been uh, gleaning from the new improved WordPress charm. So anyways, I would add like add and pass back in if I wanted to deploy it because it would yell because my script says check for that. If it's not there, it doesn't. Um, and then, you know, these are some things that are Google specific, like there's a did share data directory, you know, your organization's name. And in the, in the readme, I would tell the user, if you're going to deploy this, please edit the config and add these parameters. So copyright, you know, whatever, and a revision file that tracks changes. So um, that's actually important because if I modify the charm locally and I want to I want to send an update, the Juju uh, bootstrap node looks for the revision number to say, hey, has it changed? And then it pushes it out. So if I go to hooks, this is where the magic happens. So um, there's an install, stop, start, website relation join, DB relation join. Um, those are the simple ones I needed for Moodle at this point. There's lots of hooks you can make. The basic ones are install, start, stop. And the ones like website, website relation joined are for scaling. So when I add a peer website node, there's a script to help me, you know, add the database hook or attach the shared storage or whatever I need to do between those website nodes. Maybe they're independent and I don't need to do anything, then I don't need the hook. Um, DB relation change is whenever I add a new database relationship. What am I going to do? You can also do website relation change, not joined. I lost one. Um, there's a whole bunch. There's a whole bunch. Load balancer relation is another one you can do. Um, the WordPress one will have lots. We'll start looking at those. So these are just basic scripts. So if I look at my install script, it's a bin bash script. I'm adding charm helpers, which are some shell programs to help you debug and stuff. Updating, installing the latest packages. This is uh, to send to the debug logger that, that string, installing Moodle web service independency, so that you don't sit there and think, what's it doing of all this time? And then I'm adding packages I need for that, for starting Apache, making some directories, fetching the latest version of Moodle from Git, uh, the latest stable version, you know, changing some environment parameters for permissions on the, on the that I checked out. And that's the install script. If I look at the start script, or actually the DB relation change script, this is, once I add the database relationship, the things I'm going to do. So this is a bit more complicated because I'm, I'm using this relation get charm command to say, give me the name of the database that I'm going to add, that I'm going to tell Moodle to install itself to. Give me the username and the password for that database, which is generated dynamically by the MySQL app. So I don't actually know what that is, um, although you can get it. And get the private address. So this is an Amazon. Amazon has a private and public addresses for these machines, and the private address is kind of node-to-node -node communication within your virtual environment, public or you know, what your clients are going to be coming in on. So that's kind of what that is. Um, and then some debugging here. And then here's my where I'm... Now I'm getting the variables out of that config file I made. I'm using the config git, give me the admin user pass, the, you know, the different parameters I was setting necessary for the charm. And then passing the options to Moodle with the variable names here, with the CLI installer that Moodle actually created, which is nice of them. Um, and you know, writing, writing out the Apache config directives I want, I'm sorry, Apache. And then here's opening port 80, and the command to open the port is open port 80 TCP. And that changes the firewall for the internal communication. It doesn't expose it to the internet at that point. Oh. 
It's just opening the port internally. On that node, you have to open the port on that node, and then if you want to expose it to the world, you juju expose Moodle 80, and that would expose the services that are configured in the Moodle service group on port 80 in the in the public firewall if I wanted. That was a really quick rundown of a charm. Let's deploy some charms. And I'm going to show you the WordPress one, which is really great. So the old WordPress one was really simple. Here's the old one. It only had these hooks, relation change, install, start, stop, upgrade. So when you want to do an upgrade of your charm, uh, and re website relation join, Things were very simple. The script install script. That's it. Hmm. Right? And uh, now if we look at the new one, lots of hooks. Load balancers, NFS between the website front ends, um, cache, memcache D right here. Hmm. Lots of lots of great stuff. Provides provides website and HTTP. And the ones that are grayed out is because no other charm is asking for that. So that's what I was saying. If I just make things, like if I said Bob, I, would I provide Bob, then it would be there. But since there's nothing that uses Bob, it'd be great out here where <coughs> talk to it. If I click this, I'll get to see the other charms that actually say they support HTTP. Uh, NFS, you know, requires NFS, requires now some of these other cool things. So let's deploy, let's deploy MySQL and WordPress. Pretty simple. Two commands, deploy MySQL, deploy WordPress, add a relation, and then expose WordPress. So that'll take a minute to run. So while that's running, now when you shut down one of your your instances of a, uh, I don't even know the right words, it's a VM. Yeah, virtual machine. Virtual machine, right? When you shut that down, all that stuff's gone, and the next time you boot it up, you run through this set of commands it, it, again, right? It depends, it depends. This um, default behavior for termination is going to be stop on this, so it's not going to destroy it. But it is elastic block storage on my AWS, so it's supposed to be semi-volatile, but it's not that volatile generally. Um, but yeah, you can have it set up so that when you shut down something, it tears a doll down. Um, it's not, it depends on the cloud you're using too, because some of them behave differently. So their open stack isn't going to automatically terminate the same way. Wait, let me start running this. I don't think I answered that well for you, though. <laughs> so, okay. So it's... So this so is actually getting it and installing it and configuring it? Holds down the charm script. Um, because I, did, I, t I just told it to install WordPress, the Juju charm knows to go to the charm store and get it if I don't tell it to use a different repository. You can have local repositories, you can have so that you can override the charms, make your own customization. So that's going out to the Juju store, just fetching um, the charms. It pulls down the charm scripts. It starts to talk to the bootstrap node, pushes the charm scripts there, and the bootstrap node starts to execute, create the VM, you know, start running the, each script through. So if I run a Juju status now, you see I've got three virtual machines now up at the top, one, two, three. There's zero, one, two, I mean. Two are not started because they're still running through fetch down your image, start installing, provision, that kind of thing. I've got three, two services now, MySQL and WordPress. It says what charms they used and how many units are, how many machines are allocated. And the machines are named like MySQL slash zero, WordPress slash zero. Slash zero. Um, and the, the bug log really hasn't seen any activity yet. It'll start seeing them when they really start kicking up. Does this always create a new machine for every service? Yeah, that's what I was. It does, unless you do something that they really don't recommend you do. Okay. Um, so, right well, down here. They don't here. recommend to do it, just say, just oh. we'll leave it in now. <laughs> Placement local. I'll, I'll okay, show you. I don't want to run three different machines. Well, Placement local means to run everything on the bootstrap node. Same machine as the bootstrap. Okay, uh, yeah, there's a to do that's not for this cycle, but. In a hopeful cycle yeah. to get co-location of services onto uh, on same machine. So in theory, you could set up a small WordPress site by installing MySQL WordPress yeah. on the same box. But currently, everything could be on the And you can kind of do that uh, with subordinate services. Yeah. Um, it, but the subordinate services aren't meant for like MySQL. 
subordinate services are meant for like our syslog. So I want to I want to add our syslog with my our syslog config to do remote sh remote log shipping or something to my web server. There is a subordinate service. Let me see. It's actually I can find it in the guide over here probably because I haven't played with them that much. Subordinate services. So yeah, motivations, monitoring, backups, some types of storage. It's, yeah, it's, like you it's mean, like sys running, tools, you know. Right, it's like unit running on your system so that you could keep track of the load and stuff on that machine. Yeah. That's also running your web front end or whatever, right? Yeah, so uh, it, it basically defines an, a relationship with the parent charm, like, you know, um, let's see here. Services, our syslog right here is a, an example. Subordinate to WordPress. So it's going to deploy to the WordPress nodes. Um, it's kind of lighter, lighter use. So they have a, I think they have an example of the, there we go. Deploy our syslog, add relation our syslog. Our syslog is created as a subordinate service. So it's not a, it hasn't been defined as a full blown charm. Right. Um, where was that? Oh yeah. Now you see this thing scrolling. It's fetching all of the, the packages and everything. It's doing its updates. It's installing uh, MySQL and WordPress at the same time, so you see them both kind of cycling through. Yeah, two running machines. Right. Two different VMs running at the same time. They're both pulling down their, <coughs> their packages and everything for the services that we told them to deploy. Now if I go to, this is my local machine. So on this machine, I have an environment YAML that says to do local charms. And because it takes forever on my slow machine, it has not enough RAM, and because it also, um, we probably tax our access point here a lot to pull everything down. I've pre-deployed uh, MySQL WordPress um, on this machine, like on the local machine with LXC. So you can do a lot of your charm testing without having to deploy to Amazon and cost you money. It's, you know, I probably wouldn't run this in production on like a real website I wanted to host. Mm -hmm. But um, but you could. Yeah, but they, but you could. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, in fact, that it's running right now if I visit it. <coughs> it's right there. 192.168.122.73, which is an internal LXC address that is on my laptop. I think I exposed it, so um, I don't know what it would be accessible to anybody else on the access point as. So I can start to fill this out. And, you know, WordPress is running. So, um, well, that's... Well, the other one is still loading, so I'm assuming it's still loading. Yeah. Okay. Then I can do. So, how you get into the machines? Because they all have key-based authentication, but I don't know what the admin ID is. I don't know what the passwords are. So I can do SSH to these machines. Like, well, actually, this is local, so I don't know how this is going to work. Let's see what it does. Hey, it does work. Cool. <coughs> so I just SSH to my MySQL instance on my local LXC right there. You just do juju SSH space service name slash unit number. So zero was the first MySQL database I installed. You can SSH right in like that. If you want to um, debug, you can do juju debug hooks MySQL zero. And it will open up a new window on that instance. And then I always forget a command. Let me look. <laughs> you can tell it to rerun a specific hook on your other um, shell. You can say like rerun the install hook and you can watch it step through and see where your errors are in your hooks. Um, here we go. Starting to bug I was right there. That's really cool. Uh, nope, that's not it. Sorry. I thought I was right there. Uh, writing charm. Test run. Debug hooks. Yeah, okay. So I would tell it to re resolve. I've resolved the condition. I want to retry the config. I would run that run that syntax there. So there's my MySQL node on the right, and there's my shell on just my local workstation on the left. Let's try to do it again in MySQL zero and see what it what it does. Oh, it was already fine. It's because I didn't do this right. I should have debugged one that had an error. There, WordPress zero has a configure error under agent state. So let's go into that. And then this 
You only need to do that the first time you connect each node. Oops. Okay. Nope. Man, I'm going to successfully. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's skip that for now and go back to the cloud. <laughs> so, uh, I think these are done. So, I just deploy MySQL. It says they're started, right? WordPress is started. MySQL is started. And now I add a relation between them. Okay, you see this going off on the side here and it's creating the database hooks and such. Adding relations probably don't take too long. Okay, it's still running. I see a get public address inside here. When you normally install WordPress, doesn't it automatically build the MySQL tables figuring so you've got MySQL installed on the machine? Uh, I have not made an app get installed WordPress in a bit, but I think it does do a package configure uh, and fire it up and ask you for credentials and stuff to your database and ask you what port it's on and everything. So how can this, when you're putting MySQL on a separate machine, building it at a separate time, how can WordPress install when MySQL's not there yet? MySQL is on that separate machine. It's on that separate VM. And in those hooks that we found, that, that uh, DB relation change script is saying, okay, I know that I have ad a database has been added to me and I'm WordPress. I'm going to go ask the instance with the VM, give me your username, your password, and what database I should use, and, and, and all that and stuff. Host. And it's just importing it. So it, that's, that's the cool part is that they, they're talking and asking each other for their parameters. Mm -hmm. And the, the MySQL password is generated on the fly with pwgen, you know, so it's all, it's all happening. Um, so it, that's because MySQL is a dependency of WordPress? No, well it is. It, the WordPress service, if I was to expose it, it would say missing dependencies. But um, it's because I did that add relation. When I run this add relation command, WordPress says, hey, I've got a new relationship. What is it? What does it provide? And MySQL says, I provide MySQL. WordPress so says, I okay. need MySQL. And it hooks so it. So it didn't it completely it. install WordPress until you do that add relation. Then it yeah. Once oh, you run right. that, once you run that, it, it depends the on the MySQL. Oh, yeah, it depends on the charm. Some of the charms yeah. start going creating database tables and stuff. And other ones, other ones kick you off to the WordPress front end that already knows how to talk to the back end so you start plugging in stuff but and then you it don't create need to a MySQL server because that can be on a different host. Yeah. Yeah, it is. In this case, it's on the second yeah. one. So uh, that's done. So now I've got relationship added. And then I think we just expose WordPress. <laughs> Service was exposed. Let's see what it says here. Everything says started. Started, started, started running. Cool. So now, if we visit this public address here, uh, which is going to be annoying right here because of that. Oh wow! Line highlight. Yeah. It's so actually wrapped, and I don't think you got it all. No, he didn't. He knows that. There we go. WordPress is live. And wow. cool. so the, this, this is a great charm though, the WordPress charm I'm going to steal all kinds of ideas from <laughs> because they've done a ton of awesome things in there. Let me find, where is it That's at? the nice thing about open source. It's not yeah. stealing the share. <laughs> it's share. So, it's not stealing um, share. Yeah. so like here, there's these tuning parameters, this juju set command. So they have different profiles they've built. So this, this, this tuning there does not do very many things, right? Um, it says that you, you're just going to run a, a ba pretty basic WordPress out of the box. It supports a load balancer. It's actually doing, you don't have to add HEProx anymore because they're doing Nginx, load balancing within Nginx. So the different, if you add more, actually let's do that. Let's add another unit. So when it provides HTTP, it doesn't care whether it's Nginx or Apache or you, you, you tell that in your charm which one, which package is actually. You, yeah, you can. I, like I'm trying to figure out nice ways to tell, let people pick a little bit, but some, some in some cases it's just 
Whoever wrote the charm likes Apache, or they like him to that. When you install WordPress, you have to have a web server, so the charm is set up to say that in order to run WordPress, you need Nginx, PHP, 5, whatever. Yeah. Whatever. So you don't have to give it any of that. The charm right. is programmed for all that. If you had a different, then you would have to fork the charm or do your own or whatever, right? Yeah. So what I just did is I added a, uh, I added, um, a unit. I just ran juju add unit WordPress. And now if I do a juju status, I'm supposed to have two web, web frontends. So now I've got two units for WordPress. Um, because they're providing native load balancing in Nginx, they both should work. So let me hit this and keep refreshing and see what this stuff tells me. Let's see if I can get quick enough. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'd have to SSH into it to see if it's actually. Oh no, it's not up yet. So it's pending. Yeah, it takes about three minutes for an EC2 instance to, to start up. Yeah. And you've got to run your charm install and stuff. So while it's pretty darn quick as far as sysadmin time goes, you know, a five, seven, eight minute window, <laughs> uh, it, it is a little slow for demo purposes. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, so um, these tunings, so they've got, you know, bare is like pretty bare bones. It supports load balancer, but not much else. Then they got single and optimized. And this like turns on caching and like, you know, all this other stuff. So you can run these. Optimize is pretty difficult to work with because you can't, it doesn't it doesn't share things. You can't actually, like down here it says, in order to install and modify plugins with Optimize, you need to like make your own forked version of the charm to have it push those things into your charm because it's not doing NFS because NFS isn't quite optimized for between the web servers. So um, lots of cool stuff in here though. So they have some stuff about sh sharing the content in here, um, how to debug things, but some stuff about caveats deploying to HP Cloud instead of Amazon. You know, here's it, here's them adding the scale out for NFS. So they're adding NFS and emulation. Adding, you can do minus N3, like minus N to add multiple relations. So I could do juju add, you know, add unit minus N10 and it would stand up 10 instances. Um, memcaching hooks. The, word, the WordPress one's really good. <laughs> it's really, they've done a lot of awesome stuff in it. Um, oh, the last, the last thing I guess is, let's see where this is at. I want to see if this works. It's still pending. Okay. Um, Juju minus E tells you other environments. So like I said, you can have multiple environments in your, in your YAML file. So if you had local and EC2 and OpenStack, you can do minus E and then Juju, I mean my Juju hyphen EC2, she would just call it out by, by environment name. Like Juju I can use too, local, whatever you wanted. Also, let's go over to my local machine over here. Where is it at? <laughs> ah. <laughs> it, it was just annoying to do it. So you can do, this is how you would explicitly reference a repository. So you would do minus minus repository and And then I would do local, precise, noodle. Yeah, I knew I did that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Have you typed the command before? Yeah. Control I always R. forget I always forget my order though. Hang on. Does control R work in that? Oh, I don't know. Um, could always just grab your bash history. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Okay. No, yeah. the charms is here. No, it's this one. Right, that's what I just did, right? Right, yeah. The repository yeah. equals local charms is what I'm using that. Is that like an Etsy house shortcut that you added or something? No, I don't think so. I think that's wrong. <laughs> Maybe. Not sure. Oh, that's right. You're right. My firms are a little messed up, so it's trying to deploy Moodle now. And it's like going to probably kill our wireless and stuff. <laughs> so, and it's my laptop's working really hard at the moment. So um, you can also do a just destroy service. I can say destroy service WordPress, and it will delete everything related to WordPress. So all, all the WordPress nodes, if I have 10 of them, will destroy them all. 
Uh, if I do destroy environment, and, I'm, and it, with the minus E, I name the right environment, um, it can destroy a specific environment, or I can say destroy environment, and it'll destroy all environments. So every single machine that's configured, it'll delete the bootstrap node, oh, everything. Wow. And then you can start over, you can do your bootstrap, and just go from the beginning again. Um, there's all kind of, there's restart machines, uh, let's just pull up the help. So. Unexposed, take it away from the internet, terminate machine, you know, SCP, the specific machines, remove a specific unit, remove the relation. Um, I haven't played with open tunnel, that sounds fun. <laughs> so I think that's it. Let's look at the public one one more time because I want to see if, uh, if it says it's there. Started, started. Those <coughs> should be good. I've got two different public I addresses because that's how the Nginx uh, load balancing is working. Is it's bouncing, it's doing redirects. So it doesn't seem to be redirecting me. Yeah. Wonder if I have to do more work looking at that. You have to do that at the DNS level, would you? No, I think. I haven't, I haven't looked at it, but I think what it's doing is that Nginx is doing its own who's, who's gotten most connections. Oh. So the main DNS entry you have for your website, like everything comes into the first machine and then they send them a rewrite to the DNS name of the second machine and then the third. And it's a DNS rewrite thing. It's not quite as slick as doing like a front end IP with a, you know, HE proxy or varnish or something cool. But it's a it's a way to eliminate a VM because otherwise you'd have to run a varnish VM or something until they converge. It. <laughs> so uh, I was trying to paste that. It didn't really work. Did it? No. Oh. I thought I had it. Oh, it's just one eighteen versus one twenty. Oh, no, it's like number. I never yeah I never trust because Amazon's got so many IP blocks that you, the chances of your next VM coming up in any kind of sequential anything is pretty slim in my experience. <laughs> So, yeah, it's not it's not bouncing around. It's probably because I have to do, I have to probably give it a config directive for my host name or something for it to work. I'm not sure. I haven't really played with the WordPress load balancing. So that's it, I think. Are you aware of anybody using this in a real big way? Uh, sites that you might have heard of? Uh, oh my God, Ubuntu uh, uses it. I thought they stopped using it. Did they stop using it? <laughs> they were using it. <laughs> yeah. Is that because they're all set up now? Or? I think they, they, they baited it, but they had some use case that wasn't 100% covered at the time. I, that, this is also a couple months ago, so they need Well, the, the latest, greatest WordPress with the different configuration options, we all came out of that. Yeah. Oh my God. A lot of lessons learned. A bunch of stuff was that. Because they needed to scale up during like release time, but then they had scaled two up, and they needed the ability to say, "All right, you know, to yeah, handle like the, they handle like the mem caching and all that extra stuff." So like all that came out of basically making OMG Ubuntu run as efficient and fast as possible. Um, and now it's the point. So now like you know, during a new Ubuntu release, when they get a big hit of traffic, they just go in and do you know, juju deploy ten more WordPress nodes, and they all fire up, hook up to the same mem cache instances. And suddenly you've got 10 new front ends sharing the same memcache, MySQL, and all that front end, uh, back end, and boom. Mm. I'm trying to see if there's any little testimonial that's put on their site. That was my main one that I knew, so it's pretty new. And I think that you know most organizations are pretty nervous to jump right into something like that. Mm. So I think I think that it's slowly gaining some traction with the smaller sites first, of course. And, um, okay, yeah, the, they have the charm contest. They're trying to get people to basically you know, the chicken and egg, you have to the right charms yeah. to do things to make administration easier for people. Um, Canonical's using it. Uh, our internal uh, IT guys are all they're sending, they're doing a sprint right now to turn like all the internal services that we run into charm services that they can more easily manage. Well. And um, you know, it's the kind of thing we're going and showing to you know. Yeah, but is, it, is anybody outside of the Canonical Ubuntu launchpad world? Well, uh, my work's using it. Um, we have a proof of concept up for DNS name servers uh, for all of our locations that um, they were caching Linux boxes, you know, and configured kind of and rolled out when we needed them. And I think that uh, we have a proof of concept up to run Metal as a service and start pushing it. So I've got the charm for DNS kind of half done. So it's not up yet, but we plan on using it. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I'd be curious to see who, who starts taking to it big time. Um, 
anyone wants to work on the Moodle charm, you know, <laughs> that would be great. So I don't know much too much about Moodle, but I knew some people that wanted to look at it. Um, I was curious, and I don't see it in here. There's a pretty cool cluster charm, apparently, but I think it's not quite released yet for distributed file services. And there's also a charm that I think it was actually scrolling right over here. Uh, it's RDP, XRDP. It's not. It's in uh, the Launchpad bugs as well. But it provides you with an Ubuntu 12.10 uh, test image, along with RDP to um, the remote uh, reader now, so that you can you can basically run you know Juju deploy XRDP on desktop and get a desktop in the cloud. Um, that looks kind of interesting. Um, the other thing I should probably mention is that there's also constraints. So if you look at, I didn't really talk about them, but if you look at my instances that have been stood up since I started running stuff, let's refresh, so we see them all. I've got you know four VMs that made, they're all M1 small size. You can you can run a set constraints command to tell it uh, T1 micro or M1 large, and these are these are going to be service specific to tell you how big and how much RAM to allocate or how much CPU to allocate for each VM. So you don't have to make them all the same size. You can say the database is huge and the web servers are small, but there's 50 of them, or you know, whatever, you need, whatever you need to do. For, for <laughs> DNS servers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's eight cores for caching name servers with yeah. tiny offices. There should be a blog post coming out. Um, the Linux Plumbers conference just went down. And all the service stuff, the website and scheduling site and all that was all done through Google Charms. And so they're doing, they're working on the post after the conference has done, a blog post describing how they set up and how they did it and stuff. And, um, so it's kind of cool for that kind of idea of like you have a conference, you spin up a bunch of stuff, you run it for the four days of the conference <coughs> and you shut it down. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Cool. That's it. Nice. Thank you. Thank you.